thanks everybody for, uh, for, for joining. Um, today, we're going to have a couple of talks in, the, in this be a, a webinar on in index-based uh, livestock insurance. They'll both be around 30 minutes, uh, and then we'll have a 30-minute uh, uh, open Q&A period. Um, as always, any clarifying things you can type in the chat, uh, discussion, discussion type questions, let's, let's save those for the Q&A. Uh, period. Uh, first, we're going to start with uh, uh, Nathan Jensen, and then second will will be uh, uh, Steve Wilcox and, uh, and and Chris Barrett. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, Nathan, if you could go ahead and uh, and, and queue up, and uh, we'll uh, let you take it away. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. We're doing okay. Uh, I want to start and say thanks so much for the SPIA folks for organizing this series. Uh, inviting us to speak and, of course, supporting our research. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the index-based livestock insurance product. Uh, I'm going to start by providing a little bit of context and background for about 10 minutes, and then we have two different research questions that we're looking at uh, under SPIA, and so I'm, I'll do about 10 minutes for each of those questions. To begin with, there are about an estimated 50 million pastoralists in Sub-Saharan Africa. The map on the right shows the continent of Africa, and the purple are the areas that the dry lands we see might Arid regions where we think of pastoral usually exist. Uh, pastoral households rely on extensive rangelands to generate a large portion of their incomes. This is the yield produced by from the animals. The source also calves meat from those animals as well. And of course, droughts can cause low forage and water availability, which you know, results in lack of milk, lack of um, reproduction from the animals. And then when the droughts get really severe, the animals then become emaciated, so you can no longer sell them or slaughter them for meat. So it impacts their income quite a bit. In the very end, if it becomes very severe, you can actually lose your productive asset, your animal, which is a large portion of the wealth for these households. And it's been shown you know, through, a, through a number of research papers that these, uh, this loss of income and asset is really driving the, the high poverty rates that we see in, in these regions. Below is a, is a map from Fuse that he's downloaded it, uh, this morning. And it's the food insecurity for the, the near term. And you can see there's a crisis, a humanitarian crisis unfolding in the front of Africa. And this is because the, over the last three sort of rainy seasons, there's been very little precipitation. So this, is, this exact dynamic that I just described is taking place. And although the rains have, have returned um, over the last month or so, it still takes a long time for these households to build back up their productive capital. So even if their animals haven't died, they're in really poor condition right now, and they have to sort of have enough food to get in better condition to become pregnant and then start producing food or milk in that case. It's going to take a while for these households to recover if they ever do. Um, the index-based livestock insurance product was developed with the, with the objective of mitigating the impact of droughts on these households. Insurance is often used in these types of situations to address agricultural risk and weather risk. Um, they uh, sort of a conventional insurance policy is not feasible in this area because there's no client level sort of information with which to develop risk profiles that you'd need to, develop, to um, sort of figure out what the premium rate would be. And you would have to monitor households to monitor for things like moral hazard. And then of course, loss verification when the animals are really remote would be extremely expensive. So instead of um, indemnifying the loss of specific animals, they write policies based on indices that are correlated with the risk. In this case, it's the E-modus NDVI time series. So NDVI is sort of an image of greenness of the earth. And the USGS processes this image <clears throat> and produces a 10-day <clears throat> image. That's what this image on the top left here is. So this is a 10-day image of um, the greenness in an area at the pixel level. Uh, let me back up just for a moment, sorry, just so you, to put these maps in reference. So in the top right corner, there's a map of the Horn of Africa. And you can see we're gonna be operating in Kenya and Ethiopia. So those are outlined there. And that blue area, those are the areas where insurance has ever been sold, where every product has ever been sold. And the blue area is composed of smaller areas that we call index units. And each of these insurance, so this insurance policy that you buy for a specific index unit, and that pays out if the forge in that unit is, becomes much worse than normal. And it's based on an index of greenness for that area. 
This second set of images here is uh, the process that's used to develop the index from the NDVI data. I won't go through it in detail, um, but you can look in the relink, for example, uh, to, to learn about the details of the processing. What's important is that payouts are made in anticipation of forage scarcity. So households can use the payout to either you know, help them meet their consumption needs or to purchase inputs for their animals to help their animals weather the, the drought that's coming. The policies are commercially sold by local insurance companies and reinsured through international markets. Uh, there was a pilot in 2010, that's when IBLI first launched in Kenya, and then it, there was a pilot in 2012 in Ethiopia. And since then, there's been a lot of excitement about the, around the product and it scaled pretty dramatically. In 2015, the Kenyan government integrated it into its social protection programming through the Kenya Livestock Insurance Program, through which it purchases policies for 18,000 households in, in the arid regions of Kenya. And since 2018, WFP is used as in part of its programming in Ethiopia and is currently piloting in Zambia. There were pilots scheduled for Sudan and Somalia. There was sort of the preparatory work was taking place. COVID and some insecurity has delayed those. So I don't, I'm not positive if they'll come through. Um, but we've also performed feasibility studies across um, sort of the Sahel and West Africa countries. Finally, the same type of policy has been used by ARC to develop um, and its sovereign level insurance product for pastoral regions. So this is something that's scaling. Um, there's a lot of people that are very excited by it. And part of that is because there was a lot of evidence around its impacts that were developed. When the original pilots <clears throat> launched, they were accompanied by a strong research design that includes randomized treatments in both Ethiopia and Kenya and large household surveys that were collected between 2015, 2009 and 2015 in Kenya and between 2012 and 2015 in Ethiopia. This means that there's a lot of evidence of its impacts right now. There's evidence around the, uh, factors that relate to uptake, like product understanding and quality. Uh, there's evidence that having insurance coverage does reduce your reliance on uh, what we think of as detrimental drought coping strategies, such as selling off your animals or skipping meals. We do see shifts in production strategies in ways that are very similar to how we see changes towards high risk, high yield production strategies in, in cropping systems. And so households start to invest more in their particular animals to increase the productivity of these animals. And this trickles through into welfare outcomes that are observable in the survey data. Um, there has been studies about its impact on informal insurance practices. And so there's some concern that in, insurance product could sort of undermine these informal practices that have existed. And there's really no evidence that it does. And actually the, the one paper that looks at this really carefully finds that it can support some of that sort of informal risk pooling. And there are some mixed results on its impact of coverage on resource use. And I think Steve will be talking about that more, so I'll just move on. The two research questions that I'll be talking about, the first and foremost, uh, what are the factors that relate to the dynamics of insurance purchases and sales? And this is really a unique uh, sort of research design that we have here because we'll have administrative data of purchases at the index unit level. And it's very different than most of the demand studies out there that are looking at household level demand, household level factors that drive demand, contract level factors that drive demand. Here we have administrative data and we have a lot of spatial and temporal variation that is quite unique. The second study is going to be looking at what are the long-term impacts of the Sibley product. I've listed a co-authors for each of those studies there. So the first question, factors related to dynamics of Ibley sales. Once again, the picture on the bottom left is the index units sort of in Kenya and Ethiopia where Ibley has ever been sold. What we have is we have administrated from each of the four insurance companies that have ever sold insurance across these 115 index units. These sales data are from between 2010 and 2020, and there's two sales seasons in each year. So the result is we have nearly 1,500 data points. The figures on the right then are the total sum insured, they're maps of the index units and the color indicates the total sum insured in each year. So we've aggregated the two seasons in each year just to make it easy to look at. What you see in 2010 and 2011 is the original pilot in Marsabit. So that's where there's some purchases in the Marsabit area. 
then 2020, 2012, the Verona um, pilots launch and you can see some purchases there. And then by 2013, there's already the commercial providers are starting to sell insurance outside of the pilot region. So even though the pilots are ongoing, the companies are starting to sell insurance outside of those um, counties and in, in ECLO and Wajir in this case. And down, down here by 2016, we see that they're selling in Tana River, Mandera, Carissa, Takana, and then by 2018, they're in Samburu as well. So this is the entire arid and semi-arid region of Kenya. And it's stayed in the Brana zone of Ethiopia, except for some of the other um, programs that I mentioned. So a little bit about the data we're gonna be using. There are a lot of zeros in this data. Um, and this is important, and this is actually sort of one of the things we'll be thinking about. There are a lot of times where the insurance company is there and they're selling insurance in an index unit, but there's absolutely no sales. So we don't know to begin with, if, is this a supply side issue or a demand side issue? Is there somebody that's supposed to be selling in this area, but it's too far, so they don't feel like going there, so they don't actually make the effort to go out and sell insurance? Or are they trying to sell and just nobody purchases the product? On the right hand side, this is the conditional distribution. And once again, our, our, um, our unit of observation is the sales season, firm, year, index unit. And so this is who, how many people bought policies from this firm in this index unit in this specific season. So our first question are, are there specific sort of features of index units that make them you know, unlikely clients of Italy. So there's somebody that's supposed to be selling insurance there, but we really don't see them buying insurance from that index unit very often. And you know, an obvious thought would be, okay, maybe an index unit is too far from where people, from where the insurance agents live, or maybe they have the wrong sort of livelihood. Maybe it's a crop, an area where people are growing crops and they don't even rely on, on, um, on livestock. So our first analysis, we take the outcome variable is the number of seasons in which Italy was, the sales were above zero to the number of seasons in which Italy was sold for each index unit. So this is single value for each index unit. It's you know, aggregated over, over all the seasons. And we rest that on, on a number of features that are sort of fixed at the index unit level. Like is, does the population of livestock matter for how many, how many policies, if people are purchasing insurance or not? Does the distance to a large town matter? And what we see here is that really these things can explain very little of the variation in this. So it's not that people are just avoiding areas that are, or the insurance agents are just avoiding the index units that are really far. Um, we include a, a metric of, of fatalities from violence using the ACLA data set. It's not that it's sort of conflict ridden areas or disrupt the supply chains and so there's no purchases. So these, these fixed value, um, factors are unable to explain this variation. Um, it's really driving a lot of, you know, whether or not people even have, seem to have access to insurance. Then we do the, the sort of seasonal level analysis. And here the outcome, there's a number of ways to think about the outcome. Were there any policies sold? Um, the total policies sold, the ratio of, of the population with coverage, the ratio of livestock that were covered. Um, and then there's a whole set of covariates. We're not going to go through the, the estimations uh, individually or I won't make you look at all these coefficients. But what we've done is we've grouped them together into different categories. And the first one contains most of the variables that, that most of the research that I'm aware of, at least, is looking at index insurance uptake examined. So thinking about premium rate, was there subsidies? To what extent was there any sort of marketing support? Contract details, were there payouts? So this is really what people are usually studying when they're thinking about um, insurance uptake. The other fact, the other two categories, three categories are other things that we can look at because we're using administrative data and we have so much spatial and temporal variation. So we can think about which firm is selling insurance, does that matter? What are the circumstances? Those are some of the things we looked at before, but also there's this huge social protection program that was launched in 2015, the CLIP social protection program. Does that increase? purchases by other people or does it reduce it? So what we do is we run these analysis on the uh, extensive and then intensive margins. And then we do what's called a Shapley decomposition after grouping these variables together. And that tells us to what extent do, does each of these groups of variables explain sort of the power of the model? So what extent does it sort of contribute to the fit of the model? 
And that can tell us how important these variables are, not thinking so much about statistical significance, um, but really about importance of, in their ability to explain the variation in the outcome. So here's an example thinking about the extensive margin. So whether or not there's any sales or not within each index unit within each season. So these are probit models. Um, and just sort of summarizing the results, what we see is in the first category, the implementation variables that I, that I was arguing at least are the most heavily studied variables. They are of course important. But what's more striking is that the firm itself is much more important. So these are just a simple set of binary variables that are telling us which firm is selling insurance. So even after controlling for these factors related to the, the contract itself or how it's sold or the environmental circumstances, the firm itself is very important. In addition, the fixed effects of the location are extremely important. And this is also after controlling for many of these variables that we thought were important. So what does this tell us? I mean, it tells us the firm is much more important than the premium rate, for example, in this case, or exactly the details of the contract. And that the location also turns out to be very important. In the intensive margin, um, we find things very, very similar uh, with the, the large difference being that at the intensive margin, we're not able to explain uptake very well at all. And so we can see the R squared sort of along the bottom here are very low. So that tells us that most of what's happening on how much people purchase, how much is sold within an index unit in, in a season is unexplained by all of these variables that we included in there. And this is actually pretty consistent with some of our other research looking at what explains how much insurance people purchase. It's really difficult to sort of predict how much insurance people will purchase looking at their individual um, characteristics or apparently the characteristics of the, of the insurance policy or the characteristics of the location they live in. All right, so to sum up this first research question, um, while the characteristics of the insurance policies are important, there are large unobserved firm, agent, and location level characteristics that are much more important. This is true even in this example where actually the firms are quite similar. Um, there, there are some differences between them, but they're all local insurance firms that are selling sort of person-to-person -person, um, policies. The ways that they're sold and the regions that they're selling in are quite similar. So there's not a lot of variation sort of in observable features. I would say that this is a sort of a word of caution for ex assuming external validity of location or for specific studies. And so if you had one firm versus another firm, sort of the outcome or at least the uptake of the product would be very, very different. And it highlights the importance of, of partnering with strong insurance firms. Our next step is we're gonna do a series of interviews with uh, the insurance firms at headquarters and, and their insurance agents to try to unpack some of this. So what is it about these different insurance locations, different seasons, the way that they sell insurance that could, that could be driving this variation that we're still very much unable to explain. All right, so for the second research question is on the long-term impacts of Ubli. This will be using a very different data set, but we're still in sort of Northern Kenya, Southern Ethiopia. The product is still exactly the same. We're gonna be using household survey data here. We're building on top of an existing um, set of RCTs that took place during the pilots. So in Kenya, there was a baseline collected in 20, 2009, and then follow-up surveys every single year through 2015, so in one year. At the same time, there was randomized premium discounts that were distributed to those households. In Ethiopia, something very similar happened. So there's a baseline with follow-up surveys annually. Um, there's premium discounts that were distributed. And what we did sorry about that, uh, is we collected one additional round recently. So in, in Kenya, we collected an additional round there in 2020. And in Ethiopia, there was an additional round collected in early 2022. Sorry, there's lots of things flashing on my screen. I hope you can't see them. Uh, empirical strategy, we'll use a simple Anacobo strategy where we'll be looking at outcomes, current outcomes from this last round of survey data. We'll control for baseline outcomes. So in the case of Kenya, for example, we'll be looking at outcomes in 2020. 
controlling for those, those same outcomes in 20, 2009, any sort of covariates that we think are important, then we'll be looking at the impact of Italy. Because Italy could be um, endogenous, so it's likely to be endogenous, we'll be using those original discount coupons that were distributed as the instrumental variable. Those discount, um, discounts were distributed six times in Kenya and six times in Ethiopia. And so we'll actually be doing a count of the number of discounts that you received in the instrument for a count of the number of times you purchased insurance in those periods. This is two sort of strong implications for the research design. Number one, we're gonna be very explicitly looking at the impact of Ibli purchases during those pilot periods on current outcomes. So we're not looking at purchase in the, in the, in the years between because we're unable to sort of instrument for them. And the second is that we need to, we'll be following house, we'll be using only households for, for whom we have full data of those purchases for the entire period of time. So this is means households that are, are sort of in the balance panel. The outcomes uh, we'll draw from, from the literature and from our experience to, to pull out outcomes that we think are important. So income for adult equivalent, this has been shown, it has been shown to impact this. Education, herd size, and then some indicators of production. I wanted to mention here that uh, often when we think about the research design, um, people want to talk through how, we, why, and how we think purchases between you know, 2010 and 2015 could impact outcomes five years later. So there's, there's two sort of channels that I think of. One is this direct, in, direct impact, and that's that you purchased insurance say in 2012, that led you to, um, as we see in the data, to, to become more likely to purchase uh, livestock inputs in 2012. And from then on, you've always sort of purchased more livestock inputs and that's somehow successful in increasing your and so, you know, some years later, you're still doing this thing, and the increase to income is going to be considerable. The second is indirectly that early insurance purchases could increase later insurance purchases, which could then impact later outcomes. Unfortunately for us, this channel is mostly closed. Um, for reasons we don't fully understand at this point, between the pilot period and the endline surveys that we collected more recently, there's been very few insurance purchases in the pilot regions. So we're still trying to understand this better, but it seems like during the pilot periods, the insurance companies were investing sort of intensively in the pilot areas. And then as they came to a close, they decided to scale geographically. And when they did that, they reduced their investments in these areas considerably. Um, but we're still, we're still not very sure about why that happened. And of course, I think uh, we hope that our, that first research question is able to inform on. Uh, for, for, the, for the current analysis, we're using only the Kenyan data because the Ethiopia data is still being cleaned, it was just collected. And we'll be using the 737 households that participated in all seven survey rounds. The map on the right is again the index units and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the red dots are the households that we surveyed recently. So here's the results um, from these outcomes that we looked at. The first row are, is the impact of Ibli on the outcomes. Each of these columns is a different outcome. The baseline uh, control is the second row. So we can see that there's sort of a strong relationship between uh, these outcomes at baseline and the outcome now, you know, 10 years later or so. Importantly, you know, the first row shows that there's, there's not any relationship that's evident between Ghibli purchases uh, during the pilot period and the current outcomes. Uh, the estimates are quite imprecise, and so we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, sort of moving down the table, just to sort of point out what the rest of the rows mean, down near the bottom, we can see that the first stage we have is the instrumental variables are quite strong, so that's great. And the very bottom is the baseline mean for the outcome, just so you can see the, the sort of the scale of the, of the coefficients of the row. So we really don't see that there's any impact of the future. The next steps, this is what we're going the preliminary analysis doesn't show every, any evidence of impact of the purchases. I think the first next step is to really think carefully about looking at the impacts that we saw, you know, in the original set of RCTs and the research papers that were de developed at that time. 
how would they be sort of expressed these five years later? Should we be looking at the exact same variables? Or is it that households, you know, once they once they had some initial impact, that they changed their production strategies in a way that we have to sort of think carefully about that? We need a much better or much more thought around our, our model of change there. Of course, we're going to bring in the online um, data from Ethiopia, and that should increase our power. And then there's a sort of another <clears throat> part of this is to think carefully about these IVs. So these IVs have been used um, by quite a few studies very successfully. Um, but what we're going to add to this is we're going to think about the, the potential spillovers, spillovers of these IVs. You can imagine if you're in a community and all your neighbors receive discount coupons and therefore are more are purchasing insurance. Um, does that make you more or less likely to purchase insurance? If it does impact your insurance purchase, maybe you're like, everybody's talking about this, this new insurance thing. I'm learning about it from my friends, so I'll purchase it. Or you think, you know, all of my friends have insurance coverage, so I don't need to buy it because it's a part of my risk pool. Um, these are going to impact the strength of the ID, of course, but it could bias the estimates. Then we're going to think about that very carefully and see if we can study that. The Ethiopia data ha does have some network data sheet that should help us. All right, that's the end of everything for me. So thanks very much. I think we're going to be leaving questions until the end of Stephen's presentation, right? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Nathan. Um, that was that was great. So we'll um, go ahead and and indeed leave questions and let Steve go ahead and queue it up. Okay, thank you. I had to run and get some water. All right. Give me one sec here. Okay, it looks full screen on my page, but uh, as long as everybody can see it for the most part and it's uh, not creating any distortions in the visual, um, we'll proceed. Let me know if something changes. All right, so the, the project that I'm, the title I guess of my presentation today is Lessons Learned and Being Learned in Studying the Environmental Impacts of Microfinance an empirical study of index-based livestock insurance in East African rangelands. And with me on this paper are Chris and Nathan, as well as um, Francesco Fava, and Joki Kwahu, uh, Hiroto Soto, and Ben Porter, Jing Sung, and Pat Clark. And so combined, we represent a lot of different organizations, um, including the USDA ARS, um, ILRI, Cornell, and Universidad Austral in Chile. And let's get going. Let's see. Okay, so the charge I was given to was to focus more on lessons and methods and- Steve, your slides didn't advance. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, so I'm gonna start out by giving you a quick research overview of what this project is and what we're doing. And then I'm gonna transition into uh, some lessons um, that have come to the front of mind as I've been um, working through our preliminary results for the last few months. So our objective and questions are quite straightforward, but the implementation and um, uh, the actual doing is, is where the hard part uh, is, uh, as usually is the case. But our primary objective here is to conduct the first empirical study of the potential natural resource impacts from Italy. And our study, it's worth noting, comprises the first known econometric impact study of empirical range lines impacts from any policy or program uh, at scale, at least that we've been able to um, suss out. Uh, and if folks are aware of other examples, uh, we would appreciate that being brought to our attention. So our basic question is, is does Italy have a measurable impact on range line quality? If yes, what's the direction and magnitude of the impact? Um, and are the net effects negative or positive for rangeland quality? Um, and for folks who maybe don't know, um, rangelands are often cited as the most dominant land type on earth. Um, and one definition, there are a bunch of them out there, but one useful definition is lands on which indigenous vegetation, climax or natural potential is predominantly grasses, grass-like plants, forbs, shrubs, and it's managed like a natural ecosystem um, even if plants are uh, introduced. Um, so it's useful to uh, observe that one can construct theory models um, to hypothesize about what the direction of impacts might be 
but the net results are really ambiguous. Um, so therefore the, the empirical work that we're doing is really important. And there has been some limited work that's been done at the household level that's focused on uh, production outcome uh, type variables. So herd size, herding effort, and the evidence has been really mixed between the data sets that are available uh, between Ethiopia and Kenya. Some of the results show that households have been increasing herd size um, in uh, parts of Ethiopia as a result of the bleed, but in Kenya, it, it shows somewhat opposite. Um, so the downside impacts, uh, if it really were to induce negative impacts to rangelands could be particularly worrisome, um, you know, in the sense that uh, degrading the rangelands would negate uh, the, uh, the gains in, in many ways from this product itself. Um, but upside benefits, uh, I hasten to note, are entirely possible uh, by theory, and uh, those would expand enumerative benefits. And the basic idea here is, uh, in terms of these different directionalities, um, you know, from one vantage point, uh, if um, Ibli relieves the constraint on the need to provide self-insurance in terms of maybe overproduction, maybe the provision of herb, Ibli relieves that constraint and production maybe declines to a, a, a no, more nominal level. Um, but on the other hand, maybe it's uh, relieving a production constraint and gives folks incentive to increase production in some way. So in terms of estimators and data, in the study, we're leveraging the staggered rollout of Italy that is positively exogenous to rangeland conditions. Um, and if there are questions about why we're confident in that claim, um, Nathan and Chris can maybe chime in later, but the basic idea is that in discussions of where and when Italy has been rolled out, there haven't been any discussions that our uh, team is aware of where rangeland conditions have been part of the discussion as to where and when that's happened. Um, so this setting lends itself to difference in differences. And we're focusing on these new non-parametric group time difference in differences estimators, uh, I'll refer to as GTDID from Callaway and Santa Ana. There are some analogous estimators from uh, Roth and Santa Ana that are somewhat similar, although we favor the Callaway and Santa Ana estimators, particularly because they allow one to at least do some conditioning of estimates um, from the pre-treatment period. And then we're also doing um, two-way fixed effects tests uh, for the appropriateness, appropriateness of two-way fixed effects in the setting, the presence of negative weights and so forth um, that have been put forth by Jack Yella. Um, I'll issue presentation of the, the math uh, for now, unless folks have questions afterwards, we can go back into it, I have a slide queued up for that. Um, in terms of data, we have 21 years of semi-annual data from 2000 uh, to 2020. And on the Ibley side, the end result of what we're doing is we're inverse distance weighting the universe of continuous measures of Ibley exposure to construct downscaled versions uh, of these of exposure that are binary. And I'll get more into that as we go along. On the rangeland side, we have 30 meters squared uh, land cover data of mapping rangeland types throughout the study region and 30 meters squared uh, measures of fractional cover uh, comprised of the group, the uh, fractional types of bare ground, photosynthetic vegetation and non-photosynthetic vegetation. So think of a pixel and um, uh, uh, measuring the actual proportion of that pixel that pertains to each of those types, bare ground um, and those two types of uh, vegetation cover. And then a variety of different reflectance and non-reflectance based vegetation indices. And then for controls, precipitation, temperature bins and burned area. So this is a quick graphic just to give you an example uh, uh, a demonstration of what the distribution of this rollout of Italy has been over time. So on the y-axis we have, or on the left-hand y-axis, we have thousands of uh, TLUs, tropical livestock units insured. And then on the right-hand side axis, we have different measures of how the actual area exposed to Italy has been changing over time. Okay, so we have very preliminary results at this stage. Um, so I went, I won't spend, I would encourage you to not uh, get too, too hung up on what the message might be from this at this point. Um, but we do find statistically significant evidence at this point for mixed impacts. So uh, BG stands for bare ground. So increased bare ground, decreased non-photosynthetic vegetation, increased photosynthetic vegetation, and perhaps some indications that there are enhanced uh, productivity of vegetation going on. 
And we also have evidence that these uh, impacts are heterogeneous by broad rangeland types. And I'll get into more of what I mean by that in a moment. Um, but generally, you know, if uh, these results kind of continue to hold up this broad uh, picture as them, we're going to need to parse what these net effects really mean. Uh, and we're not quite there yet, but we're heading in that direction. For next steps, we're going to be employing a second version, an updated version of our land cover and fractional cover data um, that uh, incorporates some efficiency gains and some accuracy gains um, in our processing. Um, we're going to study some additional vegetation indices, in particular uh, solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence, known by its acronym as SIF. We're going to look at uh, constructing a principal component-based analysis range and health index, which takes a suite of measures that we're working with and collapses them into one singular index measure. We're going to add some descriptive calculations on carry capacity and livestock distribution. And then we'll estimate the full sweep of group time cohort impacts um, and there's really a, it's interesting, there's quite a dimensionality issue in terms of the number of group time cohort impacts that can be studied uh, using the Callaway Santana estimator. Um, that takes some time to think about and ponder. This is an example graphic of what uh, in the Callaway Santana parlance would be the simple uh, average treatment effects on the treated for the uh, cohort that's treated that where uh, Italy was first introduced in 2010. For fractional cover. So simple ATTs, the general idea here is if you think about a standard event study type plot where you have uh, point estimates for every single period post-treatment and what those treatment effects might be, the simple ATTs aggregate across all of those and you get a singular um, uh, point estimate across all of those. And that's what you're looking at here. So um, on the x-axis here, we see what the dependent variable is, the modifier here, all high and low. These are, this is capturing rangeland heterogeneity. So all is all rangelands. High is um, um, mappings to higher forage production rangelands and low is mappings to lower forage production rangelands. And we see the same story that I told you before, um, positive uh, and by and large statistically significant impacts on bare ground. Although you can see it's heterogeneous in terms of where and how large the impacts might be but then decreased impacts to non-focusing static vegetation. And then if we look at an analogous plot, but in this instance, the dependent variable is different reflectance-based vegetation indices. So NDVI is probably known to folks. Um, these other acronyms, EVI, MSAVI, and IRV, these are different reflectance-based indices that um, the literature has shown to have some, have some advantages over the workhorse measure of NDVI. And we see by and large, the point estimates are on the positive side of the ledger, um, but the, they're a bit more imprecise than the prior point estimates that we looked at. All right, moving on to some lessons and comments on our methods and experience so far. So the first thing I wanna point out is, is really important um, for folks who might be kind of considering analogous type research efforts um, and it's just been really important for our group and our research. And that's just kind of doing the preliminary work of thinking very carefully about organizing your units of observation. So, um, and I'll go through a, a few examples of what I mean by this and, and what this um, notion uh, brings to mind about. So a simple one, and some of this is simple data carpentry stuff, but it's always worth emphasizing uh, these types of things, I think. Um, so it's really important to pay close attention to potential shifts in administrative boundaries, especially for long time series. And so this gets at this uh, potential situation where you have changes in um, administrative boundary names or boundaries over time. And then when you're matching uh, data sets over time, you might have mismatch between uh, data in a, a spreadsheet somewhere and then mappings in space. And if one's not careful about that, then you can just have unnecessary uh, and completely avoidable measurement error um, uh, to, to deal with those mismatches in, in names or ID numbers and things like that. We had a number of issues um, to deal with on that end in the administrative data. Um, then it's also really important, I think, to note that administrative units, and this is well known to uh, many people who maybe work in this space, they can be a poor fit for the data generating process at focus. And they may also be inflexible 
to addressing uh, an important issue for doing research in this space, and that's the modifiable aerial unit problem, uh, which is a form of aggregation bias. And one of the best practices that seems to be out there for dealing with this is measuring impacts at different levels of aggregation and using that as sensitivity analysis. Then it's also really critical, particularly in our case, in, in many other cases out there in the world, to carefully consider what the spatial spillovers might be, um, potential for their, the existence of plausible, never treated units that might enhance one's set of comparable units. Uh, and that's uh, really important in a difference in differences setting. Um, and then it's really important to address these spatial footprint issues accordingly really early in the research process. And a particular reason for that is how this map, these mappings map into the remote sensing side. So it may be less of an issue if one isn't developing uh, novel remotely sensed measures as a part of a research effort um, like we're doing. Um, it may not be such an issue if you're using off the shelf type measures, but um, if one's doing new work, it's really critical to get that spatial footprint um, of analysis mapped out accurate as accurately as possible as early as possible because it uh, can give really significant efficiency gains on the remote sensing side because this work is really time consuming and complex. For our project, um, some of the solutions that we've come up with to deal with these things is a variety of uh, things that we've documented for doing just standard data car data carpentry shape file surgery. So dealing with inconsistencies in the IBLI index units over time. Um, we've also incorporated a set of inactive units that have been studied for IBLI expansion in parts of Somalia and Southern Ethiopia. And then as an alternative primary unit of observation, we're using sub watershed units as, as alternative units of analysis. And there's this large global data set on watershed units uh, from Lerner and Grill in 2013. So to give you some specific visuals of what I mean by some of this um, language here. So this is our study area, the mappings of these black polygons here might look familiar from Nathan's slides. And we can see the neighborhood that we're in um, from the surrounding countries. And so this mapping here, these black polygons are again, the active uh, index units. So they are locations where index unit readings are made every semi-annual period, the long range, long range dry and the short range short dry and where uh, IBD cells are active or have been active uh, over the, the period. Then this mapping here shows you, uh, we're still more or less at the uh, aggregate index unit level here, but on the right-hand side, you can see uh, another set of units that are outlined in gray that we're treating as never treated units. These units have been studied for expansion of Ibli in the future, but there are no uh, current commercial or uh, clip sales um, in these areas. And then important to note here, the mean unit uh, size of these units in square kilometers is over 4,000 kilometers, which is a really large scale and not really uh, ideal from an, uh, the perspective of measuring um, rangeland processes and pastoralist movements in general. So then if we start to bring in the picture of what it looks like when we're employing these sub watershed unit levels. So this is uh, a level eight uh, sub watershed unit in the US. Um, we often refer to these units um, out of old habit. They don't generally use this language as often anymore, but hydrologic unit code. So that's what HUC stands for. And so if you overlay the uh, Huck eight units over the active and index active and in, inactive units and take the intersection of those the black ones are are the ones that overlay with the active index units and the gray ones are inactive ones if you can see the mean unit sizes drop substantially to uh, around 700 square kilometers and then the two other levels that we're using in our analysis are the huck nine you can see here so you, again you're gaining in not only uh, degrees of freedom because we have more units of observation, but we're also continuing to decline in our uh, size of what these areas are. And then the smallest possible unit you can get is the Huck 12 level uh, with a mean unit size of around 125 square kilometers. And so when you see these different mappings, you can also think of the different uh, resulting matrices that will result that are uh, powering our, our estimations. 
All right, so second lesson. Um, it's really important to plan for credible outcome measures in a situation like this where uh, the work is, is novel and new. So it, it's important to point out that um, there is a fundamental challenge here, and that's that the potential impacts from Italy really can be measured, uh, theoretically at least, using well-established field-based measures from range science. In principle, if one had uh, infinite resources, one could have gone, gone out throughout this entire area and collected data over time and, and done some analysis. But the reality is that this is not practical for a variety of reasons, um, for us at least. Uh, in particular, because number one, we can't go back in time and collect that data on the ground. And the size is just impractical for, impractical for collecting representative data. So remote sensing is really required. Um, and the kind of the, one of the main workhorse uh, concepts out there for doing measurement at the field level is this concept of rangeland health. This has been uh, in existence for many years out there in the range science fields. Um, myself, I used to practice these methods my, um, before I came to Cornell to do my PhD. I worked in range management out in the Western US for a number of years. Um, so these tools are familiar to me. It's also worth pointing out that range land health measurement uh, from the remote sensing side is very much an active area of research. It's well established how to do rangeland health assessments at the field level, getting out tapes, counting plants, um, doing all sorts of different measurements from the biophysical side, but mapping that into the remote sensing spaces is novel and uh, an active area of work. Um, and then it's also worth pointing out that uh, landscape quality measured, measurement at scale and applied economics research, to our knowledge is, is pretty rare uh, at best, and there are no known examples in the economy or in the rangeland setting. So the, the basic nuts and bolts of our approach and what we're doing is we are using remotely sense-based measurement of rangeland quality, and we're grounding our approach to measurement in this concept of rangeland health, which is well-established, and also the, a companion concept known as state and transition models. Um, so we're using a combination of new and existing measures here. And so where the state and transition model co concept comes in, this is, you know, when you think of states, you can think of rangeland types, um in in dynamics and how these states might kind of change over time and so we're using remote sensing we're using remote sensing tools to map rangeland types in our study area um, this work is spelled out in detail in a working paper we have um, that's led by our colleague Gerardo Soto and uh University of Australia in Chile and this mapping permits two really important things so one it permits us to study the potential existence of state transitions which are uh, a importance in and of their own right for a variety of reasons. Um, and then they also permit us to do heterogeneous quality measurements. So you can, as I, you may recall from earlier slides when I was showing you different point estimates, I was saying, uh, pointing out, here's the point estimate for what bare ground is in higher forage production range line. Here's the point estimate um, for lower forage quality production range line. That's where that's coming from. And then we're also using a suite on drilling into the quality side, a suite of measures uh, in the range science field um, known as rangeland health assessment indicators, RHAI, that can be measured with remote sensing that cover what are known as the three primary attributes of rangeland health. So if you drill into the Pellant uh, manual for how to do rangeland health assessments, you'll see a lot of reference to these primary attributes. So rangeland health is fundamentally an unobservable measurement. You can't get any kind of singular measurement that's gonna tell you whether or not a place is healthy or not, but you can collect measures of biotic integrity, hydrologic function, and soil and site stability, um, and kind of through a holistic perspective, measure the types of things that range science has demonstrated are important over time. These are the measures that we're using in our research. And then these uh, assessment indicators are kind of the, the corollary mapping at the field-based level when one does this type of work. All right. All right, now um, it's also important to note here that this research plan was launched before we were all impacted by the existence of COVID-19. Um, so it's worth spending just a, a brief moment to talk about how our research plan for this was affected by this and how we've adapted. 
So originally, the long and the short of it is that we had plans to do a new field campaign to supplement an existing set of ground-based imagery that was collected by uh, Juan Leo and Pat Clark uh, and others for some study of uh, rangeland type mappings in the northern part of our study area in southern Ethiopia. We were going to go out and do a rapid assessment of uh, some random points throughout our study area, orient the research team to the study area, enhance our training data set in particular, and so forth. Um, those plans, of course, went out the window uh, once we were all uh, dealing with new realities. And all the details of how we've adapted uh, to these, this reality um, are outlined in this working paper. Um, and some of the high level uh, sketch of issues of how we've done, how we've dealt with this um, are as follows. So first off, we do have a large tranche, tranche of uh, ground-based images that were used in a, a pr this prior research effort from Chuan Leo and others. And then we were also had this uh, benefit from our uh, co-author, Pat Clark, who's with uh, the USDA ARS. And he had access to declassified high resolution imagery at the two meter scale from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, this NGA archive that we were able to leverage uh, as an alternative way to get a, a generate training labels for this huge uh, study area. So what we did with this data is we constructed uh, thousands of photo interpreted um, training data sets. So PI stands for photo interpretation of vegetation functional groups. So um, grasses, shrubs, trees, um, bare ground, water, impervious cover, things of this nature. And then the basic process is uh, a random forest classifier is used to classify the high resolution imagery into these different vegetative uh, functional groups. Oh, that's a typo there, that should be VFG, not VGF. And then a custom algorithm is applied to the classified HR uh, imagery to classify Landsat pixels. So the basic idea here is in the Soto et al. paper, we have um, a legend that's mapped out for different rangeland types that specify rules that say, um, you know, the proportions of trees, shrubs, and grasses and bare ground um, are within certain proportions, then it's X class. So for example, if um, the proportions within a Landsat uh, pixel are, you know, over 50% grassland, for example, then chances are that pixel is going to be classified as grassland and so forth. So a large number of pixels, pixels are classified using this algorithm. And then uh, another random force classifier is placed on the Landsat archive for uh, the study region. And then the whole Landsat uh, archive from 2000 to uh, 2020 is classified. And then from the fractional cover side, we're using a combination of what's known as bilinear unmixing and image segmentation. Um, the basic idea there is that we're using image segmentation to identify pure areas of pixels uh, um, of bare ground photosynthetic vegetation and non photosynthetic vegetation. And then there's this uh, literature on bilinear unmixing to uh, parse out what these sub Landsat pixel uh, proportions are. And then we're also using uh, a combination of existing uh, vegetation indices. All right, lesson three spillovers may be critical and non-trivial to address. So spillover effects um, are not unique to the setting of studying pastoralist movements in uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, there's a lot of settings where these types of things might be present and they may be really critical to uh, measurement of impacts. So in our setting, the nature of the spillovers comes from the fact that pastoralists don't respect administrative unit boundaries. So the implication of this is that when we observe uh, in the administrative data, some number of tropical livestock units insured through Ibley, the reality is that this is really a lower bound on the actual exposure to Ibley. And so this is a, a challenge and we need to try and address this somehow. Otherwise we're dealing with a substantial measurement error. So our approach is to use inverse distance weighting, a custom inverse distance weighting algorithm, where we take, you know, center your point of view on any unit I, and we're inverse distance weighting the exposure in all surrounding units J to any unit I within a local neighborhood. And we define, we're lucky to have some, uh, a nice data set of GPS livestock caller data that allows us to pin down what that local neighborhood is. So 
there was a campaign that was done to follow a number of livestock and their herders using GPS collars. And they were followed over 2007 or 2011 to 2015. And so to define our local neighborhood, we're taking what the mean distance traveled in the short range, short dry is, and then adding a standard deviation on the top of that. And that gives us a local neighborhood of about 63 kilometers. And then on the implementation side, what we're doing is you can vision this tabular data set of this administrative rollout of Ibli where sales are. And so we translate that tabular data into a rasterized gridded version of itself um, for each semi-annual period. And then we're applying a series of concentric buffers around every single unit that intersect with all the pixels surrounding it. And then we're taking the, the pixel pixelized version of Italy exposure and then inverse distance weighting it to the border of any unit I so that at the end of the day, the total exposure, uh, summed exposure is the observed amount in any given unit plus the inverse distance weighted amount um, from these concentric buffers and the idea being that the further you are from uh, any given unit, the less likely it is that you're going to be exposed from uh, the, the insured chill use from those areas. So it's worth pointing out that this has been very computationally demanding to deal with. So just to give you a rough idea, um, I was working on Cornell's uh, bio high, high performance computing system, doing parallel computing on 25 cores, and it required several weeks just to finish the iterations for one version of this inverse distance weighted um, exposure measure. And then finally, what we do is we adopt an exposure rule that says that um, a unit I is treated by Italy and remains treated thereafter, um, starting from the period where its inverse distance weighted exposure is greater than or equal to one insured TLU. So to give you a sense of what this actually means in space between these non-inverse distance weighted and non-downscaled versions. Let me just show these animations. So this is an animation that shows the actual rollout of Ibli sales within each index unit over time by each um, semi-annual sales period. So long ring, long dry is the LRLD, SRSD is the short range, short dry. And you can see here that these never treated units uh, outlined in gray never get any bleed in from the adjacent uh, index units. Of course, that should strike you as somewhat odd since I told you just a minute ago that uh, herders don't respect boundaries. So um, here is what it looks like at this HUC 12 level. I showed you that map earlier at the HUC 12 level. Um, and this is what exposure looks like when you incorporate inverse distance weighting and you downscale it uh, to the sub watershed unit levels uh, at the, from a continuous measure perspective. So we're taking this continuous exposure and then translating it into a binary measure. And this is required if one wants to use Callaway Santa Ana estimators as much as one might want to use these continuous measures of exposure. That's not what these estimators are, are built for. All right, so if you maybe take like two or three minutes and, and wrap up, if that's sure. Okay. Yep. Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm right there. So thanks for the heads up. All right, so the last thing I want to touch on is, uh, and I think this is really useful to point out uh, for folks that are just kind of wrapping their heads around this new modern difference in differences literature, is the flexibility and the transparency, I think, of the group time difference in differences estimation. Um, and I think that these methods are really exciting because I think that they open up the potential to consistently, consistently estimate treatment effects in a lot of settings around the world where there is staggered rollout, where there's treatment heterogeneity and there's dynamic treatment effects. And these are all the types of things that make for really interesting research settings. Um, but as we're all learning now, uh, two-way fixed effects approach are really problem problematic uh, when one has the combination of these things. So um, pardon for the uh, noise in the background there, if you're hearing that. Um, so for Ibley, it's important to note that, uh, as logic would suggest, the intensive margin, so the continuous measure of the quantity of TLUs insured within a given unit, is probably the most determinative uh, factor for impacts on rangelands. 
Um, but the recent difference in differences literature from what I can see does not offer a lot of hope for that type of approach to be reliable. We can cross our fingers and hope that maybe that changes in the future. There are a few new papers out there that are talking about um, when continuous measures of exposure might be uh, viable to use as treatment measures or not. Uh, but so far, my reading is that it's not optimistic. Uh, but these shortcomings aside, uh, um, you know, binary exposure, I think, can get us a lot, uh, especially when you consider the transparency, I think, of these estimators and the uh, allowance that they provide for really precise study of impacts. So what I mean by that in our case, for example, and I think any case in general, is that this group time treatment effects uh, difference in difference approach uh, gives us, allows us to take advantage of the fact that we know where and when different group time cohorts were actually treated. And so that means when we drill down to study all this heterogeneity that exists in our research context for these different group time cohorts, if our point estimates are saying, you know, this particular cohort uh, is having substantial impacts in one direction or another, and this group time cohort isn't, we can drill down specifically into that data and really look at it um, more closely than we might have previously to doing the estimations, look at the specific trends, look at the magnitudes and ask ourselves, does this really make sense? Is this kind of fitting together? And then also, you know, assuming we feel really confident about our, our estimates is this precision over space and time really allows one to carefully consider policy implications and possible policy responses. And in an aggregated two-way fixed effects world estimation, we're getting these aggregated um, point estimates that are these weighted averages uh, of all the different two-by-two two, uh, treatments as the Bacon-Goodman um, decomposition so helpfully points out. Um, and that, that type of analysis is not possible, but in this setting it is, and I think that's really powerful. So that's the last slide I had, and I'm um, glad to entertain any questions. All right, thanks, thanks, uh, Steve. Um, let's go ahead and open up the floor. Um, there were a few things in the chat, um, but uh, while people are kind of queuing things up, go ahead and just use the the raised hand feature if you'd like to jump in and ask any any questions. Um, I think while people are doing that, um, Karen. Um, both you and I kind of had a similar question. Uh, could I uh, ask you to to, uh, to to ask that about sort of the theory of change and stuff? Yeah, sure. The, in a certain way, I have that. I, I have a question on the theory of change for both the presentations. So let me let me make it more general than than than, than even the one the last one I would. So for the for the last presentation, so the. Yeah, and this may just be because we're less familiar with the type of outcomes that you're looking at. And so we're kind of, for, for me looking at this is like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to take out of this. Like, is this, uh, you know, is this any, is this consistent with, with any theory? And, and if so, which one uh, did we, you know, is, is there a story in which some of these outcomes are positive, some of them are negative and some of them are uh, uh, some of the impacts on, on the outcomes are positive, negative or zero. And so, and is there a way, and that was Kyle's related question, is there a way, on the, do you have intermediary outcomes even from the surveys from, from the early years that help you possibly, you know, construct that theory of changes? So this is a bit of a different exercise that, that where, you know, I guess that's the question that you start with the theory of change and does it contradict the one you had? Uh, the, or, uh, and if not, is there, an, or either way, does it fit one? And so, but I think there's a related question for, for, the, for the stuff Nathan presented, and I think actually for both pieces where, I would have thought either for the dynamics or for the long-term impacts, the, the actual weather patterns would be crucial, would be a crucial part of the, of the story. And, and, and so I know at least in one of the pieces, you look at the weather in the previous seasons, but I would have thought kind of uptake would be a function of, you know, unless farms are super myopic, uh, kind of of multiple years of experience and, and, and to what extent you know that interacted with whether they happen to have weather insurance or not and so so i guess any if you have any thoughts on that that would be great maybe i'll take a quick stab so um when it comes to 
theory of change, I guess, in, in the rangeland side and, you know, how do we think about these different outcome measures that are uh, almost certainly foreign to a lot of economists and researchers that uh, haven't spent a lot of years of their lives thinking about rangeland dynamics like I have. Um, so I guess a couple of things I would point out. So I talked about a bunch of different things. So I talked about potential for state transitions, so changes in the actual state of the rangelands, the type itself, and then different changes in these different measures of quality. So bare ground, measures of uh, the presence or absence of vegetation, quality measures on the productivity side and so forth. So one thing I would say is that this, on the state transition side, those types of impacts are unlikely to happen during the period of study that we're looking at. These types of transitions are quite slow moving, generally speaking. They are important to track on over time, but so far the analysis that we've done doesn't show that there's a lot of change taking place on that side. Um, on these shorter run impacts, so presence of bare ground, changes in productivity, things of that nature, um, if you talk to Pat Clark, our co-author, who is a rangeland scientist himself, that's what he spends his life doing for USDA ARS. Um, one of the things that he talks about in terms of a theory of change for how Ibley impacts might manifest themselves is he's, he's said that uh, his hypothesis is kind of a hypothesis, if you will, is that if Ibley is going to manifest itself with some short run impacts, say on a negative, negative side of the ledger, it's probably going to manifest itself in increased proportions of bare ground. So concentrate animals concentrated in a particular area, more pressure in concentrated areas and, and that manifesting itself that way. Um, but then on the other side, um, it's, you know, you can envision scenarios where we have pockets where that's happening because there's increased pressure in a local area, but maybe it's mitigated by other changes, uh, decreases in bare ground because there's less pressure in these areas. And so, when we look at the impacts that I was showing earlier that were showing presence of heterogeneity, one way to think about what we're seeing is that there seem to be at least hints that there's compensating changes going on. So even though we might see indications that there are, is increased bare ground in particular areas, if we're seeing increased photosynthetic vegetation at the same time, same time that we're seeing that, we're seeing increased signs of vegetative uh, productivity, then these might be signs that these things are kind of netting out uh, in a useful way. So one way that we're gonna try and address this is uh, by estimating this principal component based singular index measure that in principle is kind of combining all these measures together. Um, but I've kind of gone on maybe a bit too long uh, talking about some of these things, but feel free to follow up if I haven't gotten to the number of your question, but those are a few things that came to mind as you were uh, talking there again. Nathan, I can as well. Yeah, Nathan, go ahead. All right. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I, I saw you had a couple other questions to touch on quickly. Um, for the for the diffusion paper, certainly longer term um, indicators of environmental conditions uh, will be included in there, and I agree that's important. Um, some some of what we're it's kind of hard because I mean we can just be agnostic about it and close and throw in a whole bunch of a bunch of variables that are probably going to be pretty closely correlated and just kind of see what floats to the top. Um, but you know that's not, that's not so convincing either. So we're thinking about it. Um, certainly, some more efforts being put in. The, I think what's when you th when you mentioned the theory of change. I mean, coming into it, what what I expected to be important that has been missing from the literature are sort of the actions taken by the firms themselves. And so how you set up your um, insurance, your sort of last mile delivery uh, characteristics. And it seems that that is important. The problem is we can't really observe it very well or the things that we do observe are sort of fixed at the firm levels. They're perfectly correlated. So a few examples of that is, you know, uh, does a firm provide its agents with fuel to do extension work? And that, that happens to be basically fixed at the firm level. Um, do they offer a Sharia compliant version? So this is, I mean, a lot of pastoralists in this region are, are Muslim and Takaful Insurance of Africa was the first to come out with a Sharia compliant version, and they've, but they've only sold a Sharia compliant version. And there's only one other insurance company that just right at the end started selling one. So we really can't, we really can't separate that from Takaful Insurance of Africa. 
But these things are probably very important. We just can't, we just don't really have a, a way to distinguish them from the firms themselves. We're hoping that in our interviews with the insurance companies, we're able to unpack this a little bit. So this is, you know, I kept talking about these firms, uh, the importance of the firm and the importance of the location. And it's, it's very interesting that those things are important. And now you know, we wanna know, okay, what is it about the location? What is it about the firm that matters? So we can learn from this. And, and I hope that we can figure that out. Um, you, uh, there was a, a few other questions. I think actually, um, Kyle, your question was very much on this last mile stuff as well. And so this, this brings me to a, a point that I sort of had had before my presentation, but I dropped it. But just as a broader lesson from our study, one thing that's, that's become extremely um, evident is that sort of initial investments in our, in our partners sort of pay large dividends. And for the insurance companies, and, and this isn't restricted to insurance companies, so like anybody operating in sort of a new market or a new location, um, they're going to struggle just like researchers struggle. They don't know what they're doing so much. And so anytime we helped insurance companies invest in their processes for documenting their activities, you know, switching to a sort of a digital sales platform or a paper sales platform, then now these many years later, you know, the data are so much, they're so much cleaner, so much more complete. Um, some of our insurance companies, you know, we're still going out in the field and we're just locating sales receipts. They've never sort of brought them into the central office, those sort of things. So this original investments can really, really pay off. And we wish we had, um, you might expect even an insurance company, a private company to, to be tracking the effort and the trainings of their agents and the performance of their agents. But none of these companies have done that. They, they sort of do it in an ad hoc way. And so we can't go back many years later and look at that. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah. just to follow up quickly on that, it, it sounded like one thing that you were, alluding to was that the, the companies you work with had kind of uh, reallocated effort in some way away from the original um, pilot areas to new areas, right? And so that was not based on like their actual sort of tracking data of their efforts of uh, their sales agents. It was based on something else or sort of the anecdotal uh, observation or yeah, it's, I mean, it's through discussions with the firms. Mm -hmm. So when we talk, you know, when we talk to them about why, you know, why are you scaling into Tutana River instead of investing more in Rajir, where you've seen good sales, but you see this place are starting to fall behind. And you say, well, it's, you know, it's easier for us to scale into new geographies and have low density of sales than to sort of intensify sales in one location. And then, as I mentioned to, in the chat, um, Kieran had asked about why sales dipped so much in 2020. I, I mean, it, this is also just very, you know, anecdotal, but the, the introduction of Clip, well, it could have been something very powerful for the product It also introduced just sort of a lot of money on the table. So it's, there's a tendering process. And if you won the Clip tender, you basically, you received like a whole heap of premiums from the government, which could have been really supportive and you know, probably did support the insurance comp company or the insurance market at some level. But it also, it didn't incentivize sort of extension and outreach activities. It didn't support the actual last mile delivery because they didn't have to go out and sell the insurance product. So suddenly you saw that if, you know, if receiving a clip tender for all of the arid regions meant that you had to show that you had sold, you're selling insurance in all the arid regions, there's a huge incentive for you to go out there and spend very little money, but selling some insurance for everywhere. So we really, we really think that this at least played a part in it. I mean, the extent to which it, I can't say that, I don't think that this is driving all the dynamics that we see, but certainly it's really just to be in statistical ways. Um, there was also, you know, within our insurance companies, there's turnover and there's turnover in CEO. In 2019, of the main insurance company that was selling insurance in Kenya in 2019, and that they had an intermediary CEO who decided that, you know, they, they had to step back and sort of, rethink of their entire insurance strategy. Can I ask a clarification question? So you, so you, in, in the long-term study, you do have, you do have a first stage. So your, your, your random exposure is predictive of adoption later on. And then, am I, so, and if that, if that understanding is correct, I see Chris nodding, then, I oh, know it's not correct. Okay, 
All right, so the, the discount coupons are predictive of purchases in the season following the discount coupon. Ah, I see, but not of oh. later participation. And so, not so, long term. Okay, not long term. And so then, and so you're, and, and so am I correct in the interpretation and saying, well, as much as farmers may or may not have learned anything from those initial discount coupons, de facto the market has changed so much because of the firm's reactions that whether they learn anything or not is, is almost irrelevant because they know making decisions in a different environment. I'll let Chris answer, but I I, I want to be clear, we don't we don't know if it was a supplier or demand side issue at like that, but we, we do know that things change at the firm level and then we do see a change in, in purchasing. Ahead, and this is this is part of where adding in the newly collected data from southern Ethiopia will be, I think, really informative. Because in northern Kenya, as, as Nathan explained, the, the rollout of the government program may have some pretty significant crowding out effects. That didn't happen in Ethiopia. It is still the same insurance company in Ethiopia with which we originally launched. That's not true in northern Kenya. There is no government program in Ethiopia. So there's no prospective crowd out through a, a, a publicly provided premium payment for at least a subpopulation. So combining these two data sets gives us a chance to try to tease out what might explain the apparent breakdown in northern Kenya. Um, even during our study period, there was a season where the insurer failed to mount a sales campaign. Uh, even though we were offering discounts, we were providing logistical assistance, they still didn't mobilize their own agents to get into the field to sell any Ibli during that sales campaign. So that was perhaps a, a, a clue early on that once our support came away, that they were even less likely to be able to stand up sales campaigns on a regular basis. Um, and it, it, I think that gets to the supply side questions that Nathan is asking, but the, the perspective distortion due to government presence or turnover among firms gets controlled for nicely in the Southern Ethiopian data. So more soon on that. I might yes, think that Kyle, Kyle posed a really good suggestion in the chat about using our GIS tracking data, which unfortunately won't let us do what you're proposing, Kyle. Um, the GIS tracking data are very small N, very, very large T. There are 60 cattle that we put GPS collars on. We measure them at intervals of, of five minutes for several years. So we know a lot about where cattle went and we've replaced, if those cattle died, uh, you know, we replaced the collars. These were meant to give us much more detailed understanding of trekking and herding behaviors at high spatiotemporal frequency, but we don't have enough variation in population to really start to tease out much. We, we did randomize which of those uh, cattle were covered by insurance so we can make some basic statements, um, but it's not gonna let us look at those spillover effects. I wish it did. I guess my thinking on that was, I, I didn't realize it was so small, but even, even that it is, even when it is, and the way Steve was showing those sort of uh, concentric, those kind of uh, bands, my thought was you use that to kind of understand how far cattle normally go and then and then can use that to sort of get this sort of treatment intensity around control sites yeah we um, did that so the, okay. the, those bands are calibrated off of the, yeah. GA, the gps data from observing what distances cattle would track and then you can kind of do the normal kind of okay you know <laughs> sort of in intensity of, of uh, treatment in the neighboring areas for the control control areas. And I, I was thinking that that's where you, that was going or, or sort of the numbers you could, could, could get, but I just maybe didn't, didn't see those numbers, but I get your point that you can't do that. Yeah. You don't have, you know, 2000 or 3000 callers to right. really use right. the data directly. Yeah, it's a very expensive intervention, as you can imagine, or very expensive data collection device. It's not really an intervention, but it does allow us to, to calibrate the, the space over which we compute spillovers, because we have a pretty good read of oh, across different seasons and different realizations of weather events and somewhat different topography, because these are scattered across locations in southern Ethiopia, how far do, how far do animals go? Uh, just a quick thing on the 
the, the sort of, you know, demand versus supply and the long-term effects. I, maybe the surveys have some of this stuff, but I, I, you know, it would be fascinating to do a little demand experiment or something along those lines to just sort of assess what is the nature of demand in these places now <laughs> to see if there is this sort of existing demand that's just being unmet. Uh, you know, of course, you, you can't do this project forever, but you know, maybe, maybe you can. I don't know, but uh, you know, that would be really neat uh, to sort of speak to whether there is, you know, a lot of you know willingness to pay that just isn't isn't being met in these places where the pilot took place. Yeah, we actually are running some some new mm -hmm. RCTs in southern Ethiopia, where we elicit people's risk preferences and time preferences and subjective expectations of herd loss so that we can tailor advice about Ibli purchase for individual prospective purchasers uh, as a way of trying to, to, to get at precisely your question, Kyle. And we cross-randomize that with changing the incentives to the insurance agents, whether they're compensated based on the volume of insurance that's sold or how closely it matches what seems to be optimal purchase by prospective clients based off of their risk and time preferences and expected losses um, as, as a way of trying to tease out whether there might be uh, kind of the, the, the analog in the 1980s sovereign debt literature was loan pushing by, by creditors, right? That you know, banks would make money by having more loans out on the books. You can imagine the same thing here that if insurance agents are compensated purely on volume, Index insurance isn't ideal for everybody. Uh, so are they pushing it on people who shouldn't be buying it or pushing people to buy more than they should optimally? That we're seeing whether uh, insurance agent incentives matter more than the information received by the prospective purchaser. So I guess it's more, interesting more to think on about. That. Yeah, also interesting to think about like what the insurance agent knows and, and sort of what, what do they know in terms of targeting that product to the potential buyer. Uh, they probably you know, don't know who's more risk averse or who isn't, but they may know certain things and sort of figuring out what their existing information set, I think is really useful um, in, that, in that way. But, yeah, typically it's pretty limited information because most of the insurance yeah. agents aren't from the communities where they're selling. So it's not like you're selling to your neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. If I, let me weigh in on Karen asked a question about multiple hypothesis testing and how to make sense of this long laundry list of different outcome variables we have in rangeland health. I, it, this is a crucial question. Um, the problem is that rangeland health is a latent variable and there's so many different ways of trying to represent it. And one wants to be careful about not just zeroing in on the asterisks on a particular coefficient estimate in a forest of estimates. Um, this is one reason why Steve mentioned we're, we're building a simple composite scalar index, just a, a principal components based index as a coarse way of representing this overall. But another way of thinking about this um, is not so much multiple hypothesis testing in the sense of we're worried that we're, you know, we're over admitting uh, candidate realizations. Um, you know, satisfying a, 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 a criterion for, for rejecting the null, but more, how do you think about, for example, the fact that we find a higher rate of bare ground coverage in high potential areas, which are typically more remote areas. So areas that have largely undisturbed grasslands, um, but we find much more photosynthetic vegetation, in other words, higher quality ground cover in all locations. Um, one way of interpreting that is, is pastoralists can obviously avoid the nature of, of extensive grazing as you choose where you graze your animals. Um, if there's more photosynthetic vegetation out there, then people can avoid the bare ground areas and move to the, the areas that seem to have greater photosynthetic vegetation, more palatable forage available to them. So the, my interpretation of the results thus far, and I emphasize we still are, are working with preliminary results, is, is we're effectively getting a null result. Um, that if you were to isolate on just bare ground and people couldn't move, we'd be quite worried about this. And that would be consistent with a model in which risk reduction encourages the increased stocking rates. 
Now we don't happen to see increased stocking rates in these herds in Northern Kenya. You see some evidence of that in, in Southern Ethiopia, but the spatial heterogeneity is consistent with induced changes in grazing patterns, which we see in both places, but most markedly in Southern Ethiopia where we put GPS collars on animals. That in both cases, you're seeing some reduction in self-insurance as you begin to have financial insurance. Self-insurance is reduced in Southern Ethiopia because people exert less effort and less energy on trekking animals further distances. So the animals remain in single locations for longer periods of time, which would be consistent with generating a little bit greater bare ground coverage in particular areas because they don't move their animals as fast and as far. Um, and yet at the same time, you're gonna see improvements in photosynthetic vegetation because lots of the rangelands are able to recover pretty well. But on balance, there's really no effect here that's, that's gonna, that should induce endogenously feedback on Ibli. That's the, the underlying dominant concern is that the insurance could actually sow the seeds of its own collapse, right? That you're insuring against herd collapse, but if you wind up destroying the rangelands, herds will collapse. So the, the takeaway right now is there doesn't seem to be a concern that that would be happening. We still need to make sense of, of the detailed preliminary results and finalize the results. Well, uh, we are hit 9.30 a.m. our time. Is there any one last uh, question uh, before we wrap up? Think not. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much uh, to, to, to Nathan, uh, Steve, and, and Chris. This was really uh, this was really fun. Um, so we'll be back in business. Uh, I think about a about a month from now. Uh, th thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you.